Oh, Jerry, you doing all right? Okay, here goes nothing. We're going to uh, Bible study sort of provoked a, a little bit of a question about a couple of things, and I, I don't want to duck it, but I don't want to belabor it. But uh, I want to go along with the study that we've been doing in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Come to, if you will, Mark chapter number five. I'm going to deal with this thing on, uh, in reference to uh, what we refer to as demons. Um, now, before you come running up to me after the Sunday school hour and tell me that, you know, there's no demons in the Bible, they're all devils, I understand that. Um, when I use the word demons, I'm referring to uh, disembodied spirits. I'm referring to things that are in the Bible that are very real, and they're not fallen angels. Fallen angels in the Bible already have a, a body that they possess. A demon doesn't have a body it possesses. A demon is, uh, you're told in the Bible where individuals can cast out demons, but you're never told to cast out angels. So even the fallen angels that have fallen and those that will fall, that are still principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, and high places, the ones that will fall. There's a third of the angels yet to fall that will follow the devil. Right. What I'm talking about is, uh, is demonic things. And they have a tremendous influence. A lot of people don't give them a lot of credit. And they're, they're really real. They really do exist. But they're not sons of God and they're not angels. They're demons. They're disembodied. They have to have a body to live in. They either have to be in animals or they have to be in human beings. And in order for them to possess a body or to use a body, the door has to be open for them to come in there. And uh, you have to remember that demons like dead things, so they hang around it. So when I start talking about this stuff, it's uh, a little bit disconcerting at times because a lot of times that uh, you start talking about these things, people get thinking, oh, well, that's just something fairy tales are written about or whatever. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is something that's real serious. Now, I don't play around with it very much. Amen. A lot of guys make a, uh, actually make a living out of, quote, casting out demons, and they make a living out of studying demons and what they call demonology and that kind of stuff. I don't fool with it much. But you live in a day and time where it's becoming more and more and more prevalent, even for your kids. This thing came out not too long ago, and they had, I don't know how many sequels they ran with, werewolves and vampires and stuff like that. Vampires are always wanting blood because anemic, being anemic or having anemia makes you susceptible to, uh, to demonic influence. So the Bible says to you in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, forbidding to marry, that doesn't mean that they don't not allow anybody to marry. It means that the, the state of what a marriage is supposed to be changes in the last days. And then he says, and abstaining from meats. You say, well, why would that matter make any difference? Well, Hitler was a vegetarian. Right. You have a lot of people nowadays that are talking about an all-vegetable uh, diet and stuff. Vegetables are good for you. Don't misunderstand me. But the Bible says all things in moderation. Uh, over there in the book of Genesis, when the angels come down there to visit Abraham, uh, Abraham comes down there and here's the Lord and a couple of angels getting ready to go to Sodom. Everywhere in the Bible, angels show up. They show up as male. Amen. No female angels and no wings. Okay, demons are not that way. Angels can fly. They can move about without having to have wings. Demons walk about. They don't, they don't fly about. Uh, demons have the ability to come in your house and observe things and watch things and go tell on whatever happened. They can watch every impure thing you ever do. They're reporters of evil things and that kind of a thing, but they don't fly about. But it looks like in the Bible that they may be attributed to things like mosquitoes or flies or something along those lines. Well, while your finger's here in Mark chapter 5, we'll come back there in a second. Come to 1 Timothy chapter number 4, and I'll show you this thing. Because uh, a lot of people push this deal. Now, now look, I'm for you know, getting your system cleaned out and do all that kind of stuff and all, but you don't ever want to get to a point that you don't eat meat. Now, you do with, I, I, hey, I'm not going to get into dietary stuff because you get into trouble. Every time you get below, below the head, you get into trouble in church. Amen. You start, preachers start dealing with everything below the head. They want to deal with your gut, what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. They want to deal with all kind of stuff as far as your physical relationships with your wife and 
with your husband and that kind of junk, that's trash and has no business in the pulpit. I'm not going to tell you what to eat, and I'm not going to tell you about things you ought to know about. That's not the pulpit ain't the place to deal with that kind of stuff in, in the name of, you know, be, you know tell, being, you know, let's be biblical about everything. My foot, there's some things you ain't got no business treading into. And diet happens to be one of them. And uh, what he says here is this. He gives you instruction. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now, stop there for a second. Number one, if it's not Christians, then how would they be departing from the faith? So demons can have an influence over Christians. If you yield your body, your members, your mind, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, your hands, your feet to the devil, the devil will use it for unclean things. If you make the choice to yield. Now I want to say this as I get started on this. I'm not going to go here and say that you can blame the devil for everything. But the demonic activity has picked up just like it did right before the first coming of Jesus Christ. You'll see that show up very prevalent again in the second coming of Jesus Christ. There'll be a lot of demonic influence. This stuff, you folks nowadays, a lot of you watch this stuff and what play these games and stuff with all these zombies, the, uh, the, the uh, undead walking around, and this stuff with uh, vampires sucking blood, and this stuff with monsters and half humans and half uh, uh, angelic or demonic beings and stuff like that. That all has its root in truth. And when you start fooling around with that stuff, I believe that you're opening up a door and saying, hey, come on in my house. Now, if you want to do it, it's fine. No problem. You say, I plead the blood. I don't worry about that stuff. I think it's funny. Help yourself. I don't even like flying monkeys. I'm just saying, you know, they, you know, but you know, say, well, preacher, you're kind of making a big deal. I'm just telling you that I have a tendency to steer away from this stuff. But the Bible says this. that says the some shall depart from the faith. Why do they depart from the faith? giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The seducing spirits are not just something that makes you do things illicitly, physically in your human body. They're also teachers of false things. That's why God gave you, one, the Holy Spirit, and two, a Bible, to make sure that you know when somebody's teaching you something contrary to what God says. How do you know that happens? Well, you go to what's called the law of first mention. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, And when the devil shows up, he says to Eve, Yea, hath God said, question the word of God. So that's the thing that will happen to you in the last days. All right, watch it. He's seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, plural. Devils there is talking about demonic things, not angels. Uh, Which brings this question, well, then where do demons come from? I'll give you a supposition. Larkin teaches that they came from the... the, uh, pre-chaotic world back when the, uh, uh, the sons of God were here on the face of the earth and when the uh, morning stars sang and shouted for joy. Uh, if you study the thing out a little bit, you may find that those were angels that were here and they're probably not the, un- the, the spirits. If they are, the Bible says that they are chained in prison right now. So if that's the case, then you'd have to go one step further. That would mean you'd have to go all the way to Genesis 6. In Genesis chapter number 6, you see the sons of God saw the daughters of men they were fair to look upon, and they came into the women there, and uh, giants were born unto them. Mighty men, men of renown, no mighty women. You want to notice that. No women there. How come? Why not? Why not giantesses born? There's just men there. Now, if that's not the case, then you've got to run over to your Bible, and your Bible says in Jude, the angels which kept not their first estate. If that wasn't angels, then what was it? Right. So, well, it was the godly line of Seth. It wasn't the godly line of Seth, because godly line of Seth, if they reproduced, how come they don't continue to reproduce giants right. and men of renown? Amen. And you go through there and read that thing. The Lord refers to them over there as sons of God, and over there he refers to them as angels. Well, I choose not to believe that. Okay, no, no problem. I don't, I'm not going to fight with you over it. But if their offspring come around, that offspring would be part angelic and it would be part human being. And what it looks like is, is those are your disembodied spirits that when the flood came and drowned them out, that's Noah's flood, when the flood came and drowned them out, it looks like that those disembodied spirits, they didn't take them to hell and they didn't take them to heaven and that's where your demonic spirits come from. Now, that's speculation. All I know for sure is, is demons are real where they got their original origin or if they continued to reproduce or mass produce, I don't know, but there must be a whole bunch of them. Their origination or their, their final resting place is down in the pit and the Lord turns them loose after a while. But there's some of them that are on the face of the earth. 
and you're seeing a big influence in that stuff. All right, watch this. The Bible says speaking lies and hypocrisy. What? The devils that are speaking lies and hypocrisy. That means they inhabit a body and use the voice box of a body of somebody to get up and speak lies and teach hypocrisy. Watch it. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, not the demon, the person they're talking through, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now, he gives you here a specific thing in verse number 4. Here's why you ask the Lord to bless the food. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If, you want to circle that, it be received with thanksgiving. So you're, it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So when you get ready to pray, come back to Mark chapter number 5. You pray and ask God to bless the food. And the reason that you do that is, is he tells you every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. You're not under a dietary law. Amen. You can eat shrimp and scampi and lobster and catfish and that kind of stuff. In the Old Testament, they couldn't eat it. Uh, you eat red meat because it has, uh, it has different pathogens in it than the other stuff does. You eat uh, chicken and you eat fish and you eat turkey. God gave you all that. In Genesis, when, they, when I told you about the angels coming over there, he goes and he kills a calf over there and they have the, the calf there and they have milk and they have butter and, and some bread there. The Lord eats meat. The Lord eats fish in the, Old, in the New Testament. He eats meat. You want to be careful about anything that, that, that you abstain from meat. You say, why? Well, it makes you spiritually susceptible to demonic things. And it makes you listen to things. You need meat in your diet. There's a protein. I'm not going to get into all the stuff, but there's proteins affiliated, bless you, three or four times, however many times that was. But there's a, there's a protein that is in meat that is not in vegetables. And it's not in whey protein or powdered protein or all this stuff. Be careful about that stuff. You do what you want to do. You understand? This is just giving you... But he said, there's some people teaching you to abstain from meat. God told you to eat meat. Okay? Something has to die so you can live. It points back all the way to Jesus Christ. But you should be eating meat. You say, why? In the last days, you need to be spiritually strong. Go get a steak after church. Mark chapter number 5. <coughs> Look at verse number 12. Uh, the Bible says this. Uh, they have to have a body to be in. The Lord's fixing to send them out. He says, my name is Legion, right? My name. One name is Legion. That means comprising this one demon is a multitude of demons. And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto them a mountain, a great herd of swine feeding. The devils besought him, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Forthwith Jesus gave the unclean spirits, went out, entered into the swine. The herd ran violently down the place of the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now that just shows you that they got to have a body to be able to live in. That's the first case of suicide in the Bible. <laughs> Everybody knows that one, right? Called hogicide or whatever. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, come with me, if you will, please, over to Mark chapter number 16. Uh, you ever notice this thing about uh, demonic activity? It's connected with nudity. It's connected with nudity. Why'd you get nervous? It's gotten to be real commonplace nowadays. Girls and guys don't think anything of it. It's a regular, common, ordinary thing. What happens here in Mark chapter number 5, this fellow comes up there. When he gets cast out, he's running around naked and cutting himself and all that stuff. And I'll give you the details of that. But it, it, that's not all there is connected to it. But as soon as the devils get cast off, and the next thing you see is he's seated clothing in his right mind. Right. It's connected with insanity. So the thing is, is that when you're connected, that devil wants to use that body for his sensual pleasure. He, he wants to be able to use your body to, 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 for anything impure and unclean. And it's, it's a real thing. It's not a... Do you believe you can be possessed by the Holy Spirit? Sure, you do, right? Fill me with the Holy Spirit, right? Well, your flesh can be possessed with an unclean spirit, not your soul. And if you yield your members, he'll sure take them to, as members of uncleanness. You know what it is about Japheth? He has such a hard time getting the spiritual stuff. It's stuff, demonic stuff is real stuff. Look over here. Did I give you Mark 16? Look over here, Mark chapter number 16. You know who this lady is right here, right? In Mark chapter number 16. Let me get back here. I'm all the way over in Luke. Look in verse number 9. Mark chapter 16, verse number... Nine. Now when Jesus was ridden the first day of the week, there appeared the first Mary Magdalene, out of whom had cast, what? 
what was Mary Magdalene? Mm -hmm. Wasn't she a prostitute? Isn't that strange? Forbidding to marry. Why? Well, you know what? The more the merrier. Monogamy is no longer any good. We shouldn't just have a man and a woman as God ordained. I mean, after all, we should be able to have any kind of relationship we want to have. That's demonic. God said one man, one woman. That's how he intended it to be. Nowadays, marriage has nothing to do with that. Modern marriage has nothing to do with that. Modern marriage is what they call open marriage. Not mine. Mine can open the door and get out if that's your idea of marriage. Amen. Amen. I'm sure she'd feel the same way about me. And I'm sure the Lord would feel the same way about you. Spiritually, you're not supposed to have an open marriage. You're a spouse to Jesus Christ. Why you commit spiritual adultery all the time. It's accepted. It's like, well, you know, it's no big deal. Yeah, that uncleanness just runs rampant nowadays. Say, why? I think the church is full of the devil nowadays. That's one of the reasons I think it's there. Uh, the sons of God are over there. And uh, look in Jude, Jude uh, 6. Jude 6. I'll give you this comparison here, and then I'm going to get on to some things here about the, about the demons. Uh, and again, I'm not wanting to play it up too much, but I think it's important that you know. Uh, eat some meat. Make sure, that you, make sure you keep yourself spiritually strong. Uh, when you fast, you enter into another world. Did you know that? You get in a spiritual world. But you don't fast for too long a period of time. And if you're going to fast, if you ever don't jump off on 40 days right off the bat. Don't jump off on 21 days. Don't even jump off on a week. Jump off on a day to start with. You know, start it at sundown and go to sundown. <clears throat> and drink water while you're doing it. Make sure you don't have diabetes or some other kind of something that will make you go into some kind of epileptic seizure or whatever because in the name of Jesus you're fasting. I know a lady one time that was so spiritual she made her baby fast. That's real wise, isn't it? Stupid woman. She ought to have better sense. But, but that's demonic. That's all that is. But, but anyway, listen, if you want to fast, I'm for fasting, prayer and fasting. You know what he goes over? He says he gets ready to cast out the demon there and they said, Lord, how come we can't cast them out? And he said, this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. Right. You've got to be willing to pay the price if you're going to have that kind of power. Amen. I'm all for fasting, so don't misunderstand me. But with the exception of Elijah fasted in the presence of the Lord, Moses fasted in the presence of the Lord, and Jesus Christ, everybody else fasted with water. So at least you've got to have water. You big portion to use water. Don't just put aside water and, you know, and all that. You'll get dehydrated and fall out and flop around like a dead fish out of water. You need to have water while you're doing that. And then when you break the fast, there's a way to break the fast. But don't jump off on a, on a big giant thing. You say, why? You're in a spiritual realm. You'll open up a can of worms like nothing you've ever imagined. You'll have things going on. It ain't like all of a sudden you get yourself so set apart, you're jumping into a spiritual realm and you're fixing to be addressing some things you may not have ever seen before. And those things are real. You say, well, you're freaking me out. Well, good, good. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ and ask the Lord to keep these things away from you. But, ladies and gentlemen, your body is dead. Amen. Right? Amen. You know where demons like to hang out? Sure. They like to hang out in cemeteries and around dead, dry things. That's why it's good for you to have some life in you to keep the demons away. Amen. They like to hang around that stuff. So what you have to do is realize I'm susceptible to letting them things in. So Paul says, keep your body under subjection. Hold it in check, especially the thing right between your ears. Right. Jude 6, the Bible says this about, uh, about angels. Now, again, if you don't want to believe Genesis 6 is angels and you want to think the Son of God is too much for your brain to comprehend that there's something outside of human beings, then okay, fine. I'm not going to argue with you about it. But I might just say you, you're, you're not very wise. Right. Verse 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering vengeance of eternal fire. He makes a comparison there. The angels, what they do, they went after strange flesh. You say, well, but preacher, the Bible says they're the angels, or you'll be as the angels that are in heaven. They're neither married or given in marriage. I guess not. In heaven, you're not looking to have uh, a physical relationship, male, female. It doesn't mean they're not capable of having the relationship, but they've got to leave their habitation to have a relationship. 
that's your cage guy that comes down. That's these other guys that come down, and they got to fall from heaven in order to be able to have relations with human beings. And then when you have that take place, you ever wonder why the Canaanites were destroyed? Can I tell you why? There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. You say, why? The sons of God still looking and seeing the daughters of men and because of that relationship, there's a bloodline that takes place and giants are born to them. The Lord said, you've got to eradicate them. And Daniel chapter number 2, they'll be back again. Too much for me, man. I can't get a hold of that preacher. You, I've, you've lost your mind. Okay, well, hang around and watch and see. You ever think about how stupid you are sometimes? Or to, to people, to people. How crazy you are to people? You believe in a Jesus you've never seen, that died on a cross you never saw, that went to a tomb you've never been in, rose from the tomb who's not there anymore. He's seated up there in heaven. You've never seen it before. He's coming back and catching you away in the clouds, and you're going to live with him forever, not on this earth, but up there, and you think what I'm telling you is crazy. You're crazier than I am. Uh, that's nuts for some you think oh well, I guess I am crazy by the way you're a giant threat to humanity right now you're classified now as a threat to humanity you're classified as an American terrorist because you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ that makes you dangerous yeah read it it's true. I'm not giving you something I'm making it up you're dangerous people okay whatever hey, cut me loose man let me go all right now notice this thing that he's talking about here is these uh, these beings that were here before, they're not here anymore. Come to Second Peter. And then they come back again. Second Peter. Now I'm going to get to these demon things here in just a second. But come if you will over to Second Peter chapter number 2. There were angels that were here and they cohabitated with human beings. Um, they had to get their blood from somewhere and everything you see nowadays is truth misplaced. It's a, a heresy in the wrong place. Uh, but they had to get their blood from somewhere because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And what the Lord did for them was is he put them away. Second Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, well, when did they sin? Well, you've got to get it all together. Genesis 6. Jude 6. Quite, you know, interesting, right? Cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness, reserved in the judgment, spared not the old word, but saved no. Oh, now, the context right there is he's right there with Noah, the eighth person. Yep. Look what shows up, verse number 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. You say, why? Lot vexed his filthy conversation of the wicked. That whole thing is connected in there with demonic activity and has to do also with the angels. The angels which kept not their first estate. What happened to them? First Peter, if you will, please. First Peter, chapter number 3. The Lord's got some of them reserved and changed. He's got some of them in hell. The demonic things are still here. That means, where are they? Well, they can be in here. They can be everywhere. How many are they? I don't know. I know this. When the Lord goes over in Mark chapter 5, when he says, what's your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Well, Legion's a thousand. Well, so that means a thousand of them things are in one body. That's pretty scary. How big are they? I don't know, but you put a thousand of them in a body. All right, notice this. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 18. The Bible says, For Christ also hath suffered for, uh, excuse me, suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit, but which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. I guess they were. When the once long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, the ark was preparing wherein a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. What is he talking about? He's talking about the angels that came down in Genesis 6 and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. I'm going to wipe out the whole mess of them. And so the flood came and everybody that wasn't on the ark wound up being in bad shape. Mark chapter num or Matthew chapter number 9. What the devil likes to do, the demons like to do, is use your body as an instrument of unrighteousness. Did you get that? Uh, what, what the devil likes to do is, is to dirty up the bride of Christ. I don't want to get too graphic here, but there's, there is... Uh, uh, he gets great pleasure out of taking something that should be pure and white and clean, presented as a chaste virgin and having his way with her. 
that you, do you, are you, do you understand what I'm saying to you? The devil likes to defile the body of Christ because it's his bride. There's something in the devil and something in these demons that like to take something that's holy and put aside, the Bible uses the word sanctified, set apart for the master's use, and likes to take that thing and dirty it up. Fellas, the best way I could make that for you to understand is is somebody taking your wife and defiling her, but the bad part about it is is the wife being willing to be defiled. That's the bride of Christ nowadays. That's the body of Christ nowadays. And if you give the devil that opportunity, he laughs and rejoices at that opportunity. He thinks, boy, this is great. You need to think long and hard before you step off into sin. So what you're doing is, like I told you the other day, the back doors open up of that new Jerusalem, and you come walking through there, and he says, good night, honey. You couldn't have at least took the curlers out of your hair, and your dress is all tattered and torn, and you look like something a cat drug in, like you've been over with somebody else. What are you, what are you doing on our wedding day? And you walk in there, and you're all beat and bloody and messed up and all that kind of stuff with kind of that little devilish grin on your face, like, well, honey, you know, I just couldn't stand the temptation. And the devil likes to defile those things that are clean. So you're a target, more so than the people that are out in the world. The people that are out in the world are going to hell. As far as I know, they're a hotbed of demon activity. But he doesn't get near the pleasure out of that as messing with you. He loves to mess with you. That's why you've got to be careful about getting on to each other, man. We're supposed to be teamed up against them. You know what he says in Ephesians 6? You wrestle not against flesh and blood. So your enemy is not your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not even the world. There's something behind that thing. All right, let me show you a couple things here about them. Uh, uh, demons, uh, devils can cause uh, dumbness. Mark chapter number 9, look at verse number 32. Just helping you? The Bible says, But they understood not, saying they were afraid of him. And he uh, came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked, are you with me? I'm in math. I'm in Mark. I'm supposed to be in Matthew. I apologize. Matthew chapter nine. I'm sorry. Apologize for that. There you go. Verse number thirty-two. Nine thirty-two. The Bible says this: As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man, possessed with a devil. Dumb here is not dumb like dumb in the head, like we use it. Dumb is unable to speak. When the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. Now, most the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. So immediately, don't care that this guy can speak again, and they don't deny the devils were cast out, but they're saying, Well, it was the devil that cast out the devil, which is a whole other thing. You say, What is that? Got to get the, the, the emphasis in the wrong place. So we don't want to say, hey, God just showed up and cast out the devil. What we want to say is, is, well, we know the devil got cast out, but the devil did that. It was a trick or something like that. It wasn't a trick. It was Jesus Christ that did it. But devils can cause all kind of physical infirmities. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody that has an epileptic problem or everybody that has mental issues or everybody that has physical deformities is possessed of the devil. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying to you that they can cause these things. They can cause unusual things. Uh, look, if you will, Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. <coughs> Verse number 22. And the Bible says this, uh, There was brought unto him the one possessed of, the, of, of a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So it caused blindness and it caused dumbness. Now, I don't want to make too big of a deal about this, come over, if you will, please, to the book of uh, Luke, and you can do the research on it, you can find out that I'm, what I'm about to tell you is a true story. I think I've mentioned it to you before, but bears repeating for some of the visitors. Uh, there was a woman several years ago, I was a lieutenant at the time, and there was a, a call that went out, and this 911 call came in, and uh, this guy's screaming over the telephone and hollering and yelling, and, and uh, all of a sudden he kind of starts gurgling and that kind of a deal while he's screaming on the telephone and the guys all get there and stuff and they bust into the house and here's this guy, he's got a steak knife and cut his aorta uh, while he was on the telephone and she cut the telephone. In the background on that 911 tape you hear her going, Beelzebub, 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 like that over and over and over in a guttural tone and him screaming, just horrified. When he's first screaming, he's screaming because she stabbed that baby, if I remember right, 14 times with a butcher knife and tried to stick that baby to the floor. And then she went over while he was on the phone and 
and uh, stabbed him and cut the phone cord and then went into the back room and got one of her daughters that was blind and another daughter that was there with her, a hammer and nails. And when the guys got there, they walked into the room, uh, Dowling and a couple of the other fellows that were there, when they got in there, they walked into the room and she was walking with those girls, one in each hand and a hammer and nails and was going to go crucify that baby to the floor that was already dead. And so they arrested her and all brought her downtown, and I took the two little girls for a ride out. At that time, it was called the Gator Bowl. I let them play with a blue light, tried to get their minds off of what all was going on and laugh and try to cut up with them a little bit and, and that kind of thing and brought them back to the station. And those guys brought in all that material. And we looked over all that stuff and all the deal there, and here's her logbook where she had been to the doctor. She was on medication. And uh, the, the, uh, the doctor put her on a particular medication and was trying to help her because she was unbalanced and she was doing pretty well and had done well for several months and her family was operating fine. She went to see a charismatic uh, preacher. Right. The charismatic preacher said, you know, I'll anoint you with oil, James chapter number 5, and you'll be healed and so on and so forth. So he slung some 30 weight on her and, and, you know, she said she was healed. And he said, here, what you need to do is, is this is your book of tongues. And you need to practice these book of tongues. So we had these things where she had written down stuff. You never figured out what she was saying. And she would go around the house practicing speaking in tongues and practicing all the stuff. And she came off of her medication. Well, it wasn't very long after she came off of her medication that she killed that baby and killed her husband and then was going to go crucify that baby. And people say, well, she went insane. I hate to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, but she invited the devil in. Why is she saying Beelzebub, Beelzebub, Beelzebub? You say, what should she do? What should happen to her? Well, they should have put her to death for killing the baby and killing her husband. I know you think, well, she couldn't help herself. Okay, good. She won't ever have to worry about it ever again. You say, well, you know, you should have pity on people like that. I do. Put them out of their misery. That's right. Now, I know where this is going, and I know what you're thinking about all that kind of stuff, but I'm telling you, what that happened to that woman was some preacher talked her out and said, I know more than your doctor does, got her off her medicine, and opened up the door by this practice, charismatic practice of speaking in tongues, which is where almost every Bible study and prayer meeting always goes to. Everything that's outside the local church, eventually it runs into all that kind of garbage. Or the next thing you know, you're praying, your mouth gets running away with you, and you jump off and say something you got no business saying. And, buddy, you just open up a door for legions of them things to come in. Never seems to fail. But what happened with that woman is, is she wound up and they put her in the uh, uh, insane asylum and that kind of stuff and said she was insane. Well, it sure looked like she was insane. Who would have done something like that? Right. What are you trying to tell me? I'm telling you, if you open up the doors and yield your members, the, Lord will ta- the devil will take them and the devil will use them to destroy you and completely ruin you. Yes, what preacher has a business is telling you more than your medical doctor tells right. you? Amen. His business is in spiritual matters. He has no business telling that woman to stop her medication. I think they should go get him now and hold him culpable for what happened. I believe he's guilty. You say, why? He opened up the doors. That woman believed she was really, she believed, if you just believe, have the faith to believe. And if you really believe that you're really healed, you're really healed. Dead baby and a dead man now and a woman that's ruined and two kids that are ruined the rest of their life. That blind girl, the best thing for her, she didn't have to see that kid, that boat there with insides hanging out and blue skin all over the place and stuff like that where the blood had been drained out. She didn't have to see that and remember that the rest of her life. Now what I'm trying to tell you is is this stuff that I'm talking to you about this morning ain't something to play with. It's not, it's not funny stuff. It's not stuff, you know, ghoulie monster stories to talk about. You folks, you got, some of you got mad at me because I mentioned about Halloween. Okay, get mad at me, okay? But I'm going to try to tell you what's right to do. I, I don't think it's, you know, trick or treat is just a little candy. Go to the store and buy you ten bagfuls of candy instead of running around and participating in the devil's holiday. Well, but preacher, they're just dressing up. You mean just dressing up and being something they're not? Just have them come to an independent Baptist church. They can practice being a hypocrite. <laughs> That's funny. But, or maybe it's what they want to be. I, I don't know about that stuff. I know this. I know they're running around as zombies and they're running around. Some of you just saw me and you just all of a sudden looking at the floor like, oh, God. This is one of them fundamental Baptist church. No, no. It's biblical. You've got to be separated. Sit in the middle of your floor and watch something with your kids or play a game or something and give them all the candy. Let them explode if you want to. You know, here, here, you go ahead and enjoy the candy. You, you want to really flip them out? 
give them the history of Halloween. Just let them read it themselves. You'd be surprised. They got better sense than you do. They'd be like, man, good night, man. That's pretty scary stuff. Pumpkins and all, man. I ain't doing nothing to do with that. Okay, in the book of Luke, if you will, please. You say you're just too Pharisaical for me. Okay, well. You'd be surprised at the stuff that happens. Luke chapter number 8. Uh, demons will drive you insane. Verse number 26. You know what they call this guy? They call him the maniac of Gadara. Mania. Mental. Lose their mind. I'm not talking about genetic disorders. I'm not talking about as you grow older, certain things happen, dementia and stuff like that. That's not demonic. That's because you've been eating stuff out of a cursed ground and you're in a cursed body and that's how it goes. But don't think that everybody that has dementia or something like that, you're thinking, oh, preacher, you said my so-and-so was demon. But no, they're not demon-possessed. That's just the way of nature. Hard, hard arteries get hardened off in the brain. The blood can't get there. And the next thing you know, you're saying stuff. You, you remember stuff when you were six or seven years old. And you don't remember anything in the last three or four minutes. Right. They arrived to the country, verse 26, the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when they went forth to the land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time. That almost sounds like an Indian talking, which had devils long time. <laughs> Uh-oh. And wear no clothes. Neither abode in any house but in tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried and he fell down before him with a loud voice saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, the Most High? The Bible says devils believe and tremble. Just believing is not enough. Amen. You've got to trust him as your Savior. Amen. The devils know who he is. The Bible says this, and he said, verse 29, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out from the man, and oftentimes he had caught him, and he kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the band. Supernatural strength. You, not always drugs and PCP and, and uh, acid and mollies. That's the new big thing nowadays. And crocodile, all that other stuff. It has nothing to do with that. This has to do with demonic stuff. Uh, there was a guy down uh, town. He was a judge's son, and um, he had had to have some stuff done with his brain. He got mashed in the head real bad, and they had to put a plate in his head. And he came over the intercoastal waterway there one day, and we're looking for him. Somebody's on the bridge. Somebody's on the bridge. They're going to jump. Used to get it all the time. And all of a sudden, the guy jumps. I'm easing along there real quiet. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody up there. And I've got my spotlight, and I'm looking. And all of a sudden, this guy like comes out of nowhere, jumps off that embankment, and jumps on the hood of my car. And, and he gets right in my windshield and goes, I'm a bear. I'm going to eat you. And I'm like, I believe you. And I hit the brakes, and he slid off the front. I was tempted to, you know, but but I helped him in the name of Jesus to get, you know, in the car there and gave him <laughs> assistance and all. But that was that guy. And uh, that guy may have, he may, he may have had uh, 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 mental problems because of his injury, but I watched that guy go into Pete's bar one day and clean that place out. And, I mean, people were hitting him with chairs and throwing bottles at him and doing all kind of other stuff. And there was a big old guy in those days. His name was uh, Andrews. He wound up coming downtown I'll think of his first name here in a second. Big old, bigger, bigger not, big fella, man, and could fight, boy. And Nicky Andrews, that was his name, Nicky Andrews. And Nicky went in there and he grabbed a hold of him. Man, you talk about watching WWA, man. I mean, <laughs> but he was flinging Nicky around like a cotton picking rag dog in a pit bull's mouth, man, all over the place. Supernatural strength. The guy wasn't, wasn't that much bigger than Brad, but he had supernatural strength. You say, where's that come from? Demonic stuff. Yeah. They bound him with fetters and chains, and he broke them. Yeah. You ever see this thing? What's the green guy? Oh, oh that guy, the Hulk. He turns into something green, and he has supernatural strength. Right. Wonder what gets a hold of him. Right. When Samson got the strength, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? right. Doesn't the devil mimic? So here the devil, here the devil does it in, in the man of Gadarene, and the Lord does it in Samson. All right, the Bible says this. Uh, he bound him with fetters and chains, verse 20 and verse 30. And Jesus said, What is thy name? He said, Legion, because many uh, devils were entered into him, and they besought them that they would not be condemned but to go out into the... Uh, how about that? Sure. What deep is he talking about? Oh, it ain't the water. It's up above you. Where the principalities and powers, you say, why? Because it looks like once they get in the deep, they can't leave the deep to come down to inhabit the body. So they're saying, look, 
put us in the pigs, and then the pigs go over there and commit hogicide and that kind of a thing, and then after they're done, at least they're still left to walk about the earth until they can find a body to get into. I just don't want them to get into mine. <laughs> um, uh, come to uh, Luke chapter 13. So it can cause dumbness and blindness and insanity. Um, Luke, uh, let's see, go to Luke chapter number 13. This is enough to scare you. I guess I should have taught this before Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff scares me, man. Verse number 10, 1310, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues of the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could no wise lift herself up. In other words, she's bent over at the waist. When Jesus saw her, he called unto her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. The rulers of the sin God answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. They could care less that the woman's healed. <laughs> She's like, hey, man, you did it on Sunday. What are you doing that for? <laughs> Them Saturday. But, I mean, <laughs> ain't that typical? Right. It's like, hey, man, look, the, the, you know, here comes a guy running there, leaping and hopping and saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. And he's like, what are you doing, man? He said, man, I've just been out there on my mat. The Lord just healed me, told me to get up. First thing I'm going to go is go to church and thank God for it. And they're like, what's he doing healing you on Sunday? Yeah. Isn't that weird? Uh, the Bible says healed on the Sabbath day. There are six days in which all men ought to work and in them. And, and so he could heal him any other day, but just not that day. And not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall, lead him away of the watering? Ought not this woman to being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound? Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all the adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced in glorious things and so on and so forth. All right, the woman's infirmity was caused by the devil. Wasn't something she did. The devil just likes to take her and bend her up and mess her all up. Look in Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter 9. Now, invariably, whenever you teach this stuff about demons, somebody's going to say, well, so, uh, you know, how do you get rid of them? We'll deal with that in a minute, but make sure when you get ready to get rid of them that you got everything closed off and your gates are all, your doors are closed because they jump out of them and jump on you. Right. Yeah. That's why I'm afraid about doing it. That's a sign of an apostle casting out demons. Right. So you've got to go to the chief apostle to get them out of you. You don't go to some preacher to get them out of you. Amen. You go to the chief apostle, that's Jesus Christ, and Amen. you say, Lord, if they're in there, get them out. In the name of Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to cleanse me. Do a little house cleaning. Amen. But make sure when you clean them out that you close the door behind them, because if not, the Bible says that one goes out and walketh through the dry ground and doesn't find anything, and so you know what he does? He comes back, but he brings seven of his buddies with him. Right. That's why sometimes the second state is worse than the first state because you don't shut the door. You just keep leaving the door open. Right. Demons can come and go as much as they want. Just because they're in you don't mean they don't leave you and then they come back whenever they want. they got a lot of time. Right. Right. They see a better deal along the way. They'll get out of you and then they'll come back and come visit you a little bit later on. Mark chapter number 9, verse number... Oh, let's see. 22, I believe it is, is where I, what I want. That's it, 922. 21, he asked his father, how long is it ago since he came unto him? And he said, of a child, oftentimes it hath <coughs> cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Mm -hmm. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Uh, demonic uh, uh, things make you suicidal. Mm -hmm. Not all suicidal thoughts are demonic, but demonic things, are what does it do? It threw him in the water and threw him in the fire. You ever seen people do crazy things? I hate to bring all this stuff up. It just floods my mind here when I get there. There's a kid that uh, one of the girls picked up years ago, and uh, she grabbed a, a piece out of the back of the car. She busted the back end of the door and took a little triangular piece of plastic out of that thing, and she jammed that thing in her arm, and she started scraping her arm like this until she managed to get some veins and some muscle and fat there, and she started throwing it at that female police officer there in the back of the car, and threw it all over the back, and they realized what was going on. She was about to hemorrhage to death in the back and got rescued there, and I got a picture of her. They took her to the hospital and put all the hemostats, tried to stop all the bleeding, and they cut her arm off just above the elbow there, 
because, you know, well, she's in a drug-induced state and, well, she wanted to die and all that. Okay, maybe (laughs) drug-induced. Maybe. Maybe drug-induced is what opened her, put her in that hypnotic state that allowed her to be possessed by something that wanted her life. Why not? Take her to hell. If you die before you're saved, you go to hell. So why not take advantage of it? So demonic things can make you you suicidal. I got a bunch more of these things here. We're going to have to close here in just a second. Um, Look, if you will, please, and uh, oh, come to uh, Luke 11. Luke 11. They use victims as instruments of unrighteousness to proclaim doctrines of devils and teach damnable heresies, which I told you before. Uh, they're not only immoral, they're unmoral. Uh, you have un- inhuman uh, abilities and things that are attributed to it. They take possession for the purpose of physical or sensual gratification in the human body to destroy it. Uh, 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 nudity, licentious, lustful thoughts, they're connected there. That's where you go all the way back to the angels there in Genesis chapter number 6. But when you see demons show up over in the New Testament on a regular basis, that's what you see them connected with. That's why nowadays your television, your newspapers, your magazines, everything you turn around you see, it's all sold with that three-letter word that ends in X. And it just... just Constantly in front of your face, all the time, all the time, just blip, 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 making women think that if you're not doing that, something's wrong with you and putting this pressure on you and all that other kind of stuff. And so what happens is that's demonic, gets you involved in stuff. That's between a man and a woman in the marital situation, folks. I still believe that. Well, I, you know, I, I just think, you know, okay, well, you're going to have a hard time around here because I still believe the Bible way. Amen. The Bible is a man and a woman. Amen. And not for public information. Right. Amen. That's good. Thank you, brother. Luke chapter number uh, 11, right. verse number 24. The Bible says this, When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh. You see that? Not a fly. He walketh through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he saith, yeah, I'm going to go back to my old house, (laughs) see who's at the house. And verse number 25, when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished, but nothing has been replaced. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in (laughs) and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, what what is he trying to tell you about? What he's trying to say to you there, come to Acts chapter... uh, 16, and I'll close for Sunday school, Acts chapter 16. What's he saying there? He's saying that, listen, man, you can get the thing out of you, but when you get him out, you better replace where he was. What do you replace him with? The Holy Spirit. You replace him with the Bible, and you replace him with preaching. You replace him with the right kind of music and all that kind of stuff. So if if the devil is called Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, and their king, they have a king over them, it's the children of pride and and so on and so forth, if that king is there, doesn't it make sense to you if the devil was God's first music man that was around, Mm -hmm. that all your forms of music that are not the right and clean and stuff, that he would use that to sort of open the gate up? Sure. Say, well, preacher, you know, it's just, you know, yeah, I know, it's got a real power over you, don't it? Yep. If you thought for sure it could open up demonic activity, wouldn't you turn it off? But because it's just a chance that it might, it's like, well, a lady told me a couple weeks ago, well, it's just easy listening. <laughs> I said, okay, have you ever dissected the words? I said, next time you listen to it, I said, just listen to the words and find out how many of those words are about a man and a woman being together and not being married and about somebody leaving somebody else and about, you know, stress and strife and trouble and depression and drinking and drugs That's and right. smoking That's and right all that other kind of stuff, and, you know, I met so-and-so at the bar, and I met, just, just see if it doesn't sort of paint a picture. She said, oh, it doesn't have that stuff in it. <laughs> well, then it wouldn't sell. Country music is that way. Easy listening music is that way. Stuff from back in the 70s is that way. You can go all the way. It's not all just hard acid rock and all this, you know, demonic, and I don't know who the... the the rock and roll, hard rock and roll bands, ACDC and Iron Maiden and Ozzy Osbourne and uh, uh, all that other stuff that was back around years ago, Iron Maiden and all. I don't know who's around now playing that stuff. But I'm not even talking about that. The devil won't get you people with that stuff. Right. You're not a headbanger. You're not sitting around going, <laughs> you know, riding around shaking your brain out of your head trying to get hot. It's not you. 
You get something going in your mind, you're thinking, well, I wonder if I ought to happen to that old high school girlfriend or that old high school boyfriend. I wonder if I'd have been married with them. I wonder if I'd have stayed with them. I wonder if I'd have been a different career. I wonder if I'd have been so-and-so. Well, that's our song, preacher. Our, that's our song. Okay. <laughs> preacher, you just don't understand. No, I really do understand. I'm just trying to help you. You're going you're gonna to prevent? No, I'm not getting your car and listening to what you have. It's your business. But let me ask you this. <laughs> you, you know, what's that girl came up with some song called Jesus Take the Wheel? <laughs> she must be fixing to run off in a ditch or something. <laughs> Here, Lord, you take the wheel. I'm about to crash, but <clears throat> if he's riding in the car with you, would you play that? Can you play that and read your Bible? Oh, yeah, preacher, don't bother me. Man, I'll tell you what, when I get ready to drive the car, I say, here, Lord, here's the keys. I'll be in the trunk if you need anything. <laughs> I don't want him being no co-pilot, man. I want him to take the thing and go. So I have to say, Lord, is this pleasing to you? See, you've, you're, you're carnal. I can tell by you. Yeah, close your mouth, sister. Your flies are going to get in there. It's all right. But, but preacher, I, 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 the other churches, they go, I know, the other churches where you go, they play it on the platform. <laughs> And the music, the, the notes and the music is almost identical. They just flip the words a little bit. But they play the same stuff. You say, what is that? That's the devil. That's the devil. You folks ought to help me protect that. You folks ought to say, you know, we get visitors that come in here. You know what they're used to? We had a couple here not long ago. You know what they said? Man, i never seen nothing like this. I'm waiting for the negative, you know. And they said, we didn't know a place like this was around anymore. And I said, okay, here it comes. said, we were at a church not long ago. They had smoke coming out of the platform. And I said, was it on fire? No, no, a smoke machine when the rock and roll band came out. That's how they start their church service. Okay, but that's not where we're headed. After you're raptured out of here, it may not be before you're raptured, but after you're raptured, ladies and gentlemen, there is uh, uh, sexual promiscuity going on in the church in front of everybody publicly going on. Amen. And then it reduces itself after that to cannibalism and drinking blood. Right. That's what's happening, going to happen. As soon as it gets you Christians out of the way. There's not many of you left. Right. Right. You're oddballs. Amen. There's not many of you left anymore. Alright, last one. I said I would shut up here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting carried away here. Uh, verse number Acts 16. Oh, 16. Uh, let those folks in, Michael, if you would please. Tell them I'll be done here in just a second. I hate to cut this off and then have to give you a whole other thing on it. Verse 16, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us and brought her master much gained by soothsaying. It's a real deal. She's able to, to, to determine things that are going to happen. You say, by what? Conjuring up other demons. Other demons do know the history. You realize demons have been sitting around watching people for years? Amen. They know what's going on and what's going to happen and who's going to do what and what that kind of stuff. And they can predict the future pretty much, pretty real, real good. Right, All right, the Bible says, when do they show up? Notice when they go to prayer, mm. that demon wants the preeminence. Right. So now all of a sudden it shows up and says, hey, I want to talk to you. And notice that the demon, when it shows up, tells truthful things too. Right. You can't always tell a demon because of false things. Verse number uh, 17, these men are the servants uh, of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. What did she say that was wrong? She just said the right thing, but it was at the wrong time. Demons know exactly where to interrupt. I've watched that happen in church services sometimes. The phone goes off or the baby gets pinched or somebody, you know, all of a sudden you get a break like that. The right. service is going good and it's just like that. Something all of a sudden changes. You say, what? It's demonic. Amen. So I hope that helps you. I hate to have to deal with that subject, but I hope that will help you a little bit. And um, we'll take a break here and then we'll have the, the morning service. Father, bless your word and uh, thank you for it. And we appreciate it if you meet with us in the morning service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.